ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to Kai Kai for one of our nice di dinner series for the demonstration. And tonight I'm very pleased to have with us, uh, we sell to Oa Palm Beach, and that's Mr. the Executive Chef, Mr. Neil Bailey. And he's, yeah. got, he's got with him as well this other, I think it's another Executive Chef. There's so many in there. Yeah. So, <laughs> Matthew back somewhere, Matthew's back here. And then we got the pastry chef, Grant. So tonight you're in for a nice entertainment. Uh, they are in, uh, in Lentana or Malapan, on this big building there on the ocean. Uh, it's a beautiful place, but maybe one day you can go and enjoy a dinner at Old Palm Beach. They're always there. We're always so there, seven, days a, seven yep. days a week. Seven days a week, that's a lot of work. Yeah. But tonight, enjoy yourself, and you got the recipes. They got fancy tonight. You got the little yeah. card. So. Good, good. Thank so you. So enjoy, good guy. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> All right. Good evening. So my name is Neil Bailey. I'm the executive chef at O Palm Beach Resort and Spa, which is in Manalapan. So if you're to head down I-95, you take the Lantana exit, and it's just right off Ocean Avenue. Um, as Diane mentioned, I have uh, I am also blessed with a very large team. I have about 65. Um, culinary staff, which m we have nine outlets, which some are, most of them are open to the public. Um, we have an Italian restaurant, we have fine dining room, Angle, top rated restaurant on um, open table, and, uh, and then a variety of other things. Sushi bar, we do beachfront dining in a breeze ocean kitchen, and um, we have a private club, we have a club lounge, it's it's a, fi a Forbes five-star resort, one of 350 fi Forbes five-star resorts in the world, and uh, we, we try to do really good things as far as food goes. Uh, my primary focus is a restaurant called Polpo, so I'm the resort chef. I'm responsible for everything from banqueting, catering, box lunches, tea sandwiches, fine dining, you name it. Eventually, everybody thinks that I cook it all because um, I'm the chef. But uh, not true, but I do cook a lot. I work a lot with my crew, and uh, I'm fortunate to have Matthew Gale, who is my executive sous chef, right-hand man. He's here tonight, and um, he's worked in a variety of five-star resorts around the world. Uh, last place was in Pennsylvania. Um, and then Graham, who's uh, our pastry chef, he was just recently promoted. His first actual day as pastry chef will be, was the 30th. So he's been with us for 12 years. Our prior chef left and he stepped into the role and he's taken it over. Um, as far as the food goes tonight, I, like I mentioned, we have a restaurant, Italian restaurant called Polpo. It's, um, we actually, we licensed it from a company or a, a restaurant in Greenwich, Connecticut. A fellow named Ron Rosa um, has that, uh, that restaurant there. And we use a bunch of his recipes. We kind of followed some, a lot of his service style. And then we've kind of incorporated our own um, style into it. So having um, the opportunity to come here cook tonight, I'm, I'm focused on an Italian-centric menu, very Italian-driven. Uh, first course is going to be minestrone di vadur, which is um, basically green minestrone. So I've used all Kai Kai, Car, Kai, Kai Farms fresh vegetables just right across the board. Um, obviously, they have the classic stuff, which is carrots, onion, and celery, which will be mirepoix, goes into virtually everything soup base that you cook, any stock soup sauces. You'll pretty much start there. And then we've um, started, I started by curing some uh, pancetta. I um, took pork belly, cured it for 14 days in salt, sugar cure with rosemary, juniper, and uh, I've since rendered that fat out. I started a little bit earlier. It takes quite a long time, especially if you make your own. It gets a little bit dense. It takes a long time to get the fat out of it. But the fat is the main ingredient, um, to co oh, main oil that you're cooking in is the rendered por uh, pancetta. And then I will add a little bit of olive oil. This is parterra. This is a um, vibrant Sicilian olive oil that uh, we bring in. And uh, I'm going to start cooking it with. Uh, I've rendered. I've rendered the. Uh, I've rendered the fat out of the in, out of the pancetta, 
and that's kind of going to be my baseline of flavor. And as I carry on, I'm just going to add layers and layers of flavor in. This is, uh, it's kind of been popular now in Italian kitchens to talk about like cucina povera, which is basically the poverty kitchen. And that's, you just cook what you have. And that's the beautiful thing about minestrone. You can, there is no set recipe. You have a winter minestrone, summer minestrone. You can change and add as you please. You can add, make it with greens. You can add tomatoes. You can add root vegetables. Um, you can add meat a little bit. It's traditionally, it's beans um, being more on the, what, how would you say it? Frugal side, on the frugal side. Thank you. Thank you. She's going to help me. Um, being on the frugal side, beans and pasta would be, uh, which would give it the real body or the sustenance, make you feel like you're, you're full. Um, and then we basically add all these ingredients in, carrots, onions, celery, layer them in, sweat them off. Cooking kitchen kind of idea, when they say sweating it off, everything is, you know, has a certain volume of water in it and the heat and the salt will uh, drag the moisture out of, out of the ingredients. So if it's onions, carrots, celery, the moisture will come out, they'll soften about 185 degrees, cell structure starts breaking down, releases the water, the fancy word is cineresis, and then uh, basically we in the kitchen say sweating it off, it starts to release that moisture and water vapor hits, hits boiling temperature and evaporates, concentrating the flavor. So all the flavors be, become stronger and stronger. And our, pretty much our focus is to concentrate all the flavors and then layer them in over time to get more and more, uh, a more and more delicious um, product in the end. So I have a little chopped garlic, rough chop. That's the, Matt Gale always makes fun of my knife cuts, says I do summer dice. Some are dice, some are not. It doesn't matter so much with this. So, um, and that's one of the beauties of the Cucina Povera. You know, my grandmother did, was not a fan of perfect cuts. It was just cut it up into pieces and put it in the pot. And this is a wonderful um, opportunity to do that with this particular soup. Can you see in the pot by any chance? Is the camera, yeah? Okay, perfect. So I'm just gonna sweat that off and you can see the, the, the vegetables, vegetables will start to become translucent. And as they become translucent, you can just keep layering items in and increase that flavor profile. So right now, in this pan, or in the pot, I have, uh, I started with the pancetta, onion, celery, carrots, and then I put in thyme and garlic and fresh bay leaf. And now I have greens from Kai Kai Farm, which is a mixed, um, this is some mustard, it's collard greens. Normally I wouldn't put the greens in this early, but with the collard greens, they can be, you know, when they're not cooked, if they don't have time to cook out, they can have a little bit of a leathery texture. And uh, which, you know, is not absolutely the most desirable. I don't mind it, like I like a little bite, but I want to soften it up so you're not, uh, so you don't really have to chew on it. And it's not, it's, it shouldn't be a part-time job to eat your dinner. So we try to soften it up a little bit. And uh, I cut it into little smaller pieces as well because wearing these white coats, whenever you have any long greens, they tend to hang and then drip a nice spot in the middle of your jacket and then you have to change it. So we, uh, we try to get a little bit smaller, cut it. Again, very rough. French world, they call it ciselle is the word. You just, uh, it's kind of in the manner of the chaff cutter would, the old textbook would tell you. Um, so we take that, we add that in, and then uh, we're going to let that go for a minute and just uh, wilt that down. And so normally your greens would not go in this early because you want to keep some of that color and you want to keep the texture, keep that vibrancy and freshness. But here I'm willing to, uh, to let it go a little bit early to get that flavor and uh, to get them softened up a bit. So I'm gonna let that go. Um, we have beautiful Roma beans, which we've also got from the farm here today. I just cut them into smaller pieces. Uh, I'm gonna add zucchini. Zucchini is very, very high water content and uh, it'll, it'll release water right away and then it'll go really mushy. 
So we're going to leave that for a little bit later on. I'm going to add a little salt. Salt will also help me um, draw out the flavor, draw out the water, which I'm going to evaporate off. And then uh, kind of concentrate it a little bit. A little bit of black pepper. A little bit of black pepper. Um, and I'm going to just let that sweat for a minute. Take, take time with that. So I, uh, I grew up on a farm. And zucchini, unfortunately for me, is one of my least favorite vegetables. Because my father, one year, we were, we were selling vegetables at a farm market. And he grew a bunch of zucchini, picked little baby zucchini, sold it, and he couldn't keep it in stock. Sold it, sold it, sold it. So the next year, he planted four acres of zucchini. And uh, him and every other farmer in the county. And uh, nobody wanted it. And so we ate uh, zucchini with every meal. And I learned to hate it like nothing else so but uh, I'm kind of I'm trying to you know I'm starting to turn around I was little when that happened so 40 years later I can tolerate it but uh, it took a while you used to uh, you take slices of it egg wash it and dip it in bran and fry it and tell me it was pancakes and I was about six and I'd be like that's not pancakes and it isn't so there are uh, but in the soup, it's delicious. So Chef Gail is uh, working on soup shortly, and we're going to send that out. But in the meantime, I'm going to just keep sweating here with this. Um, we have a little bit of potato as well. So this is real earthy. You're going to have, um, we, we put in the soup back here, I have uh, mustard greens, collard greens, I have mizuna, chopped it all up. We put a ton of parsley in. And I just want that real vegetal, earthy flavor that you would get. It's really delicious with a slice of bread. This bread's from Ioli Farms. Or sorry, Ioli Farms. Ioli Bakery in uh, Palm Beach. Um, Michael Hackman is, in my opinion, one of, the, one of the great bakers in the area. And uh, so he produces bread for our Italian restaurant. And um, that's one of the ones we use that for a lot of our sandwich breads. It's a sourdough. Um, I'm going to put a little pinch more salt. I know it might seem like a lot, but it's, it's not. It's going to be perfect. Um, but yeah, he produces a bunch of bread for us, and uh, that is one of them. That's uh, a sourdough, kind of a, it's a little big for a pistol, but it's, uh, it's very, very good. I think very fresh. I'm going to add my beans in, and I'm getting there. So I just let this go for another minute. And I'm going to run back to the fridge. I'm not going to run. I'm going to saunter back to the fridge and get, because uh, I, need, I need to give it a minute, so I'm going to take my time, uh, and get chicken stock. So I made this with chicken stock. I like, to, I like to make soups with chicken stock. You can do this absolutely 100% with veg stock. Um, there are some delicious versions of veg stock that you can make. I know if you make it at home, I found the best thing for it is you put in a about a four or five inch piece of kombu, and it really kind of gives it a really nice like umami richness that you wouldn't normally get with veg stock, but it carries it a little bit. And then you can slice it up and put it in something else if you want. Good evening, my name's Matthew Gale, executive sous chef at Opon Beach Resort. Uh, currently we've got some lamb chops, Alicia Field lamb, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's blown in uh, for us best lamb in my opinion in the world. We took some local Kai Kai mustard greens, some rosemary, some olive oil, some garlic, a little bit of salt and pepper, created a paste, marinated the lamb uh, about 48 hours, and now it's on the grill. Wish we had smell vision you would really enjoy it. Yeah, that's uh, Elysian Fields is one of the premier small farm producers of lamb in the U.S. and uh, there's a partnership with them and Thomas Keller and a few other world-class chefs to uh, get a really high quality lamb on the market. It's kind of, it's a tough thing. Lamb, you know, to produce good lamb, it, it, needs, um, it needs ideally colder temperatures. I know there's a lot of places, a lot of countries in the world where they raise sheep and it's hot, but uh, the British breeds that we know and, and raise mostly for uh, domestic lamb production, 
um, Suffolk and Dorset, they generally like to, they need to suffer a little bit. They need it to be hard. Um, they need cold weather. They need to work a little bit to graze. And, um, and when they do that, they actually produce a much more flavorful meat. And actually it's, it's tied to just whole, their whole lifestyle. Like if you, for like lamb production, like if, if you take those breeds and they live in lush pastures, your actual, um, their, um, their ability to reproduce actually diminishes. They don't, they, they kind of take it easy and they don't, um, they don't reproduce, they don't have lamb. Um, the ewes won't produce lambs and uh, you'll just have a, like a reduced system. So for whatever reason, I know uh, we like to be nice to everybody and everything, but they need to struggle and uh, they just thrive. They thrive, the, the lamb and the meat taste better. So Pennsylvania uh, provides the environment where there's really good high quality protein grass and um, there's enough cold temperature and there's enough uh, work or effort that they have to, what's that? Elevation, it's in the hills, enough, enough, enough effort that they have to put in that uh, they produce really, really high quality lamb. So I'm from, I'm originally from Vancouver, British Columbia on the west coast and uh, we have a small island there, Salt Spring Island and they, uh, they produce fantastic lamb there and uh, there's a type of lamb from France, um, the west coast of France and they, Daniel pre soleil and basically the lamb eats the grass that's uh, sprayed with uh, ocean water. So the salt it kind of like sticks to the grass and gets a little bit crystallized. But the sheep eat that and they say that is the best lamb you can get. And so I don't know if that's true. I've had it. It's pretty good, but this is pretty good too. So um, I'm going to add chicken stock. So we have a variety of options with this. You can make this in, uh, in Italy, like they have different descriptors of soup. They have a zuppa and then they have minestrone and then there's one other one I forget, but nobody eats it. So we'll focus on these two. Zuppa is more like a soup, uh, broth based. And um, minestrone is more, or minestra, is more like more hearty and uh, usually very thick, chunky, stewy kind of idea. So I put a little bit of chicken stock in here and I know you can see it on the camera. Um, it's just enough to moisten it. And then I'm going to bring that to a boil, cook through all of my, uh, cook through all of my vegetables, get them soft and tender. And then, um, we should be, it should be ready to eat. I would adjust seasoning, um, potatoes. I have ditalini pasta and the ditalini is, um, basically just a very, very, it's the perfect soup garnish pasta. It's a short round, almost like uh, like a ziti, but maybe half a, well, about a, maybe a quarter of an inch long, a little more, a half inch, just shy of a half inch. Um, we'll say three eighths. I'm not a carpenter, but that would be, <laughs> that would be about, about what I figure it'd be. And uh, we'll add that in. And once I bring this to a simmer, all of this, this vegetable, will shrink down and I'm going to find that I have uh, basically the perfect consistency. So I'm going to put this stock back. I don't think I'm going to need it. Graham's running soup to the table. I'm going to pop to the back, check on the lamb. So domestic lamb is larger than uh, import. All right. Yeah. So the domestic, these racks weigh about two pounds. So it, it's considerably bigger. Um, the type of, the type of uh, lamb, the type of sheep they raise, uh, the vast majority of it is Suffolk and Dorset. But uh, there are a few other breeds. Um, those are the, the two mains that you would see. But uh, these are looking very, very nice. I'm just getting them off to the edge so we don't... Uh, so I'm, figure, I'm figuring out the, the smoke to camera ratio. I haven't mastered that, but here, um, hopefully you can see me and uh, I'm not being blinded by the smoke. Um, when, when you're grilling, um, basically, you're looking for, we, we want this to be medium rare um, in a perfect world. And when you're grilling, 
you want to get the fat rendered out and you want the meat cooked and you want both of those things to happen at the same time and so it does take a little bit of turning there are hard and fast rules when you're uh, like grilling steaks they, don't, they say you should only flip a steak once um, in the traditional way traditional kitchen um, a lot of a lot of science experts say that's not true and that you can flip it as much as you want and I find with these racks to get uh, to get the fat rendered and uh, the meat cooked properly you kind of have to turn them a lot so we just kind of keep it moving and uh, the bone side is very the bone is very dense and it doesn't transfer heat very well and and the fat is also a little slower to transfer heat so we'll uh, just keep working it but if you want to slow things down you put the bone side down and then the heat moves a little bit sl more slowly through the meat and uh, kind of just going to move these to the side as they uh, they look like they're good to me and we're going to let them rest and uh, as they rest they'll come up to temperature but they'll uh, you'll you'll get that nice red color through and it'll kind of create an evenly cooked um, piece of meat all right chef gail's here chef gail was the uh the restaurant chef in a restaurant called aqueous which was uh at nemecolon resort and it's a renowned uh steakhouse and uh really spectacular place they do amazing work and uh, he would cook a couple hundred steaks a night on a wood-fired grill or and a broiler and uh anyway He's mastered the art. I don't have his skill set in this front, but I uh, a close second, close second. So I'm going to leave that to him. I'm going to come back and take a look at my soup. How's everything? I couldn't see anything back there, so I'm assuming everyone's okay. Enjoying it so far? Good. All right. So if you look in the pot, you can see it's just starting to simmer. And uh, we're, getting, we're getting little bubbles. And uh, we, we like that. We want that um, slow, slow bubbles. So there's, there's what we call a rolling boil. And that's where the water is just churning. At, or stock in this case. It's just churning. And uh, water is hitting 212, turning to steam, evaporating. And it's just bubbling like crazy. And a simmer is just when you have these tiny little bubbles. And it ticks over, and uh, that's the perfect thing. If you're making a stock or if you're making a soup, you kind of want to get that perfect um, temperature where it's just ticking along like this. And uh, if you let it go like this, it'll um, it just, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not as rough, you know. It, when it's rolling boil, it actually like churns up the product. If you're rolling boil potatoes, it'll actually break them, fray them on the edges. Uh, I'm going to add potatoes here in a minute. Um, it'll it'll overcook the vegetables, and you'll knock the green. You'll reduce the green color content, and you want to keep some of that green. You want eye appeal, but you also want it to be tender to the bite. And then uh, I'm almost. I think I'm pretty close. I think this with this type of soup, um, best case scenario, you'd let it simmer like this. You know, for a good while. You want it just, just ticking along. I would probably leave it for an hour, 45 minutes simmering. And uh, just like that, just the bubbles breaking the surface, small bubbles breaking the surface. Let it simmer like that for an hour, and you're going to draw out all those flavors. And then, like any good stewy type soup, it's always better to eat it the next day. So you make it, ahead, <laughs> it, you make it a day ahead, and then uh, you'll, get, uh, you'll get a much more concentrated, even homogenized flavor and uh, I know because my mom told me that <laughs> part of me she, she does not <laughs> no it was yes mm-hmm we finished it today so we made it cooked it but then when we reheated it we added in um, some seasoning, final seasoning. You don't want to, I find, 
I don't, I want to season it. I want to make it taste good, but I don't want to take it too far if I'm going to serve it the next day. Next day when I heat it up, because all those flair, flavors are going to marry. And um, it's funny, in Italian cooking, they talk about marriage all the time. When they talk about how uh, things just become cohesive and they, they work together, pasta and sauce. Um, you'll cook a pasta, you'll use a little bit of the pasta water, you put it, the sauce into the pasta. Like in America, lots of times they put pasta on the plate and they drop the sauce on top. In Italy, you'll cook them together and you'll marry the two and you want to actually like have the sauce reduced to that consistency where when the pasta goes into it, it just, uh, it just kind of sticks to the edges and coats it nicely and evenly. It's not runny, but it's not, it's not too thick either. And that's the perfect marriage. So if you're looking for it, come to our restaurant. We have it in a bowl. They're hard, they're elusive, those perfect marriages. But um, this is the same thing. The flavors marry, and you, um, you'll get that, uh, you'll just get, you'll, you'll be able to taste everything. You'll get notes from all kinds of different things. You'll, especially with this, you know, there's some mustard greens in there. You're going to have that. You're going to have a little bitterness from the collard. You're going to have a little, almost like a hint of horseradish from the mustard, but you're going to taste onion. You're going to taste garlic. You're going to taste carrots and bay. And we want that. That's great. But when you, when you make this and you let it sit overnight, it, you know, you'll chill it, put it in the fridge, let it sit overnight. And when you heat it back up, you're going to want to go back and season it again. Bring it up to the right temperature, like bring it to a boil. It has to boil for 30 seconds just for safety's sake. And then you'll taste it. And then you'll come and you'll adjust seasoning. You'll, you know, me, I'll add a little olive oil just to get a little more body in it. Stir that in and you get that nice flavor. Okay, he's loud. I told you, you could hear him out here. He doesn't need a microphone. Um, that, olive oil, a little bit of lemon juice, just a couple drops. Acidity, and it's, I don't know, like, it hasn't necessarily, you'll see, like, you know, the big cooks, you know, uh, Hot, hot cookbooks, hot, sour, salty, sweet, acid, fat, salt. That's the acid part. And that's one thing that's really overlooked, I think, a lot of the times, a little bit of acidity. So if you have something that ha has high fat, a little bit of acidity is, just makes it that much more flavorful and kind of opens it up, clears your palate a little bit. And uh, so I added a little dash of lemon juice. I'm going to, I personally would let this go for a little bit and then uh, I would finish it off, but I'm going to finish it completely today because we're, we're in for a penny, we're in for a pound. Take it all the way. And it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, don't be afraid to season. Pinch is two fingers. So when someone says a pinch of salt, they want you to do that. Pinch. I'm going to do a half pinch because I had enough. Pepper, same thing. Little pinch of black pepper. I'm going to give it one more squeeze of lemon, and then I think I'm good there. I'm going to add my potatoes. How are you doing, Chef? Good. Why do you use lemon juice? Uh, why? Acidity. What's it do? It, it, well, it clears your palate, and it actually opens up. It, it kind of, the, way, the best way to describe it, I'm being tested now. No, I'm not testing. I'm asking. Okay, the, the acid clears your palate and it breaks the fat, so it, it provides contrast. And so Chef Gale is a master, like Chef Gale is honestly probably one of the best chefs in the, in the world, if, you know, country for sure, world for sure. He is fantastic and he, everything he brings to the table when he cooks is he wants these contrasts and he's, this, is, this menu is more my style where I do more traditional, I like rustic, I like simple, I like clean, I like layering flavors. He is a big proponent of avant-garde, and in his cooking, he's going to do, you know, crispy, crunchy, um, then he's going to do something soft, and then he's going to do something, um, something cold, something hot, and it's just, it's an exercise in contrasts, but it's all super, it's so well woven together that it, it just makes it an incredible experience. So if you have the opportunity to dine with Chef Gale, I would take it, um, but he, he's really a big one on that. So the acidity, so you have, obviously we started with pancetta, which is fat. We've added olive oil. We've added the greens. We have bitter. Now we have acid. We've added some salt. And we're going to add more because I'm going to put Parmesan cheese into it. 
and uh, and then you have you have some starchy texture to it with potatoes and the pasta, and then when we when we take this and finish it, so I got a bunch of fresh herbs. You should always pull the bay leaves. We look for the bay leaves. You can't always find them, but you should pull the bay leaf out and. Uh, the thyme sprig. If you're at home, of course, feel free to do what you please. But um, they say bay leaf is one of the most dangerous things in the kitchen. If you're going to choke on something, nine times out of ten, it's a bay leaf, bay leaf and prime rib. So be warned. You go to the steakhouse, watch out for prime rib or bay leaves. And bay leaf is in the soup or it's in the risotto. And so I'll set up my soup like that. And then now here, I'm adding, this is a blend of pecorino and parmesan. So we use aged parmesan, it's aged 24 months. And then pecorino, which is a sheep's milk cheese. And that also has acidity. Sheep's milk is a little bit acidity, it has a little bit higher fat content, so you're getting the fat, the acid, and then some salt. And then that kind of brings all those flavors together. It kind of, you have that, cheese will add that umami. So they talk about the tastes you're really getting them all. So I hope you enjoyed the soup. Yes, I steamed them for 20 minutes. So they were, probably takes about 25 minutes to get them cooked, cooked. But yeah, I find, uh, I find that if you, if you cook them in the liquid, so these ones also were steamed, you can just cook them in the pot. But I find they have a tendency to disintegrate or you have to cook them, you have to make a smaller cut, a bigger cut than everything else. Because um, what happens is the edges, especially if you cube them, so if I cut everything diced, edges will, uh, will cook before the center and then the edges break off. Some people really like that in real rustic soup. It's, it actually adds body and texture and it's kind of a pleasant addition. I try to, you know, we, we try to be fancy. We want to be refined. So I don't, want, I don't want that starchy edges of potatoes breaking off and clouding up the soup. I want, it, I want my broth just to kind of be pretty clean. And I, you can see, I think if you can see in the camera, you know, it really, if you took all the vegetables out, it would look like a chicken soup almost. So, <laughs> pasta's pre-cooked, yeah, because it would, it would make it really starchy. And then I don't, I don't have any control. And it's all about control at a certain point. If you put the pasta in, I know it's going to be nine minutes. Um, for this particular pasta, it takes about eight and a half, nine minutes to cook. But when is that nine minutes going to be? And I'm heating up the soup again. How, you know, I, I'm, cook, we're warming up on a stove that we've never worked on before. I don't know if it's going to take me 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So if I'd had cooked that pasta or I cooked it from raw, um, it, a, yes, it would make my, um, it would make my soup more starchy. It would give it more body. It would give it a texture. And we use a lot of like, we'll use pasta water when we make pasta. If you make a, a cacio pepe, that's actually just pasta water and cheese. Um, and you use that starch. Here, I didn't really want it. So uh, we just went a different route. But one thing I can tell you is, you know, there's, there's a million ways to get there. You can, you can do what you want to do and uh, it will be delicious. If you cook the pasta in the soup, that would be delicious. If you cook the potatoes in the soup, it would still be delicious. Um, and you can just do what makes, what works for you, right? And uh, you really kind of, and that's what makes every cook individual, right? Everybody has their technique, their flavor, their pattern, flavor profiles and patterns that they cook with. And so if everybody did the same thing, it would be a, it'd be a boring world, right? So um, you don't have to do what I do, but you can start somewhere there. All right. So everybody have a chance to eat? Okay. Everybody had time? I think we're going to start on uh, burrata. So we have a burrata salad, which is our second course. I'm just going to clear stuff out of the way.